Hello there. Welcome to the Potter's Wheel. Thanks for tuning in. I'm George Osmus. I'm one of the owners of Potter's Wheel Films, and I'll be your host for the next half hour. You know, sometimes words mean different things to different people, or the meaning can change based on the context. We open the door to misunderstanding when we attempt to impose our definition on someone else's use of a word, or when we fail to recognize the context in which it is being used. For example, twice in Revelation 22, Jesus tells John the Revelator, I am coming quickly. Now most of us understand the word quickly to mean soon or in the immediate future. However, in this context, Jesus is obviously using the word quickly to mean something else because those words were written nearly 2,000 years ago and we are still waiting expectantly for his return. It is important to keep this principle in mind in our communications with other people, but the importance is magnified when reading the Word of God. We can't afford to apply our carnal definitions to God's Word and expect to come away with a correct understanding of it. I think it's clear that this is one of the reasons we were given the Holy Spirit. Jesus said one of His primary jobs would be to lead us and guide us into all truth. We'll be examining a specific application of this principle on today's episode of The Potter's Wheel. The prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah compared the people of God to clay and spoke of the Lord as a master potter. On its own, clay has no form, no purpose, but in the hands of the master, it can be shaped into a design of his choosing to serve his purpose. He has a number of tools to help him in his work. Chief among them is the potter's wheel. James said to his readers, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. As a young believer, I often mistook decibel level or carnal emotional outbursts for fervency. As I grew in the faith and matured in my prayer life, I began to understand that God isn't moved by volume and He isn't impressed with my anger, my joy, my sorrow, my sadness, or any other emotional state that I might find myself in. To help me understand true spiritual fervency, the Holy Spirit brought to mind a scene from a little known Canadian film that dealt with a similar concept. The film was 1989's Eddie and the Cruisers 2, Eddie Lives. As you may have guessed, this is a sequel to the 1983 film, Eddie and the Cruisers, based on the novel by P.F. Kluge. The sequel was directed by Jean-Claude Lord and stars Michael Pere, Marina Orsini, and Bernie Coulson. In the original film, Michael Pere plays legendary rock star Eddie Wilson, who drowned when his car went off a New Jersey bridge in 1964. Or so it is believed. As you may have figured out from the title, Eddie Wilson is not dead, but living in Canada under the assumed name Joe West. In the scene we're about to see, Eddie is practicing with his new band when Rick Diesel, the lead guitarist, tries to follow some off-screen instruction given by Eddie and play more intense. Let's see what happens. Yeah, solid, man. Stuart, you're lagging, man. I know. I'm sorry. Charlie, you're all over the place, man. Bring it in. We ain't in a pocket, guys. It's coming. He'll get it. What is that? You said play more intense. Battery more intense. What is? What is more intense? I was in a desert once, out in the middle of nowhere, absolutely nowhere. Just me, the sand, in silence. But if you know what to listen for, it ain't silent out there. 
heard of music out there I never heard before. In the silence. That's what I'm after, kid. That's intense. You dig down deep and touch something like that, people are gonna listen. They'll listen to you because you got something to say. Not just something to show. You understand? Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. I don't think Rick and Eddie were on the same page when it comes to intense. What do you think? Let's explore the spiritual interpretation of the scene. Rick Diesel represents me, a young believer trying to offer up the effective, fervent prayer, but doing so according to my own perception and understanding. Eddie Wilson represents the Holy Spirit, a correcting, coaching presence sent to lead me and guide me in the more excellent way. As the eager young apprentice, Rick took Eddie's instruction to play more intense, applied his own definition to what he heard, and went with it. Unfortunately, what Rick considered intense and what Eddie considered intense were two very different things. As the leader of the band, it was Eddie's responsibility to rein Rick in and bring a word of correction to get his young pupil on the same page as himself. As we walk with the Lord, there will be times when the Holy Spirit has to do the same thing to us. Part of maturing in the faith is learning to recognize when those times come and training ourselves to submit to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Let's talk for a little bit about what God means when He says effective, fervent prayer. Effective is when we pray according to the will of God and not the will of our flesh. So how do we know the will of God? Again, this is where the Holy Spirit comes in. Paul explained it quite clearly to the Romans when he said, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints, listen to this, according to the will of God. So, praying in the Spirit is praying the will of God. So what about fervent? As young Rick found out in the video, louder ain't more intense. The fervency James is talking about is coming from the Spirit of God on the inside of us. I don't know about y'all, but when I get my back hair up about something, I can get pretty fervent after the flesh. But James says that the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Fervency in the Spirit can be loud and authoritative, the Lion of the tribe of Judah asserting his kingship. But it can also be still and silent, the Lamb of God making his peace known. However it manifests, when it's the Spirit doing it and not man's emotions, that's fervent. And when you're offering up the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous, and you are the righteousness of God in Christ, whether you know it or not, believe me, brothers and sisters, our Daddy God is listening. Some of you may be wondering, just how important is prayer to the life of a believer? Well, how important is air or food to your body? Your spirit needs a strong, vibrant, effective, fervent prayer life even more than your flesh needs air to breathe or food to eat. Prayer is the lifeline that connects us to our Heavenly Father, the source of true spiritual life. It is impossible to rightly function as a Christian in this world without prayer. Without that connection to the Godhead, you are left to flounder around aimlessly like a rudderless ship on the high seas. The weather started getting rough, the tiny ship was tossing. If not for the courage of the fearless crew, the minnow would be lost. The minnow would be lost. I'm sure there are many calling themselves by his name who treat prayer as an optional extra to the Christian life, but I'm here to tell you that they are, without a doubt, whitewashed tombs who have a form of godliness, but deny his power and authority over their lives. And if you're walking with a minister who doesn't put a strong emphasis on prayer, both private and corporate, you really do need to check yourself before you wreck yourself. On the subject of prayer, my pastor often quotes Andrew Murray. Prayer doesn't prepare you for the work of ministry. Prayer is the work of ministry. 
You probably get tired of me saying this, but I'll never stop saying it until it stops being true. This world is under the sway of the wicked one. Prayer is the only way that we have to break through the web of lies and the fog of demonic deception and see God's kingdom come and his will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Prayer invites him into our situation. Now, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but God doesn't generally inject himself into circumstances where he hasn't been invited. The only exception to that that I've found is the case of divine judgment. And frankly, that never works out well for the recipient. Can I get a witness? Do you want to know how I know that an active, vibrant prayer life is important for a believer? Because I have a Bible and I can read. Hallelujah. As I read the Gospels, I see that Jesus prayed a lot. The Gospels are full of instances where he withdrew from the crowds and from the disciples to get some alone time with the Father. Now, you don't have to be head cashier at the Walmart to figure out that if Jesus, in whom dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, needed prayer to maintain himself in this world, how much more do we need it? In fact, Jesus' prayer life was evidently so strong and the benefits of it so evident in his life that it prompted his disciples to ask him to teach them how to pray. And the result of their asking is what we Protestants call the Lord's Prayer or the Model Prayer as it's labeled in the New King James Version. You know it. Say it along with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I think most folk are familiar with Psalms 23. At the end of it, David says something that's actually rather profound. He says... Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Are there any among us who do not want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever? Bueller. Bueller. So it's settled then. We all want to dwell in the house of the Lord. So what does God say about his house? Well, he told the prophet Isaiah, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Jesus affirmed and confirmed this when he cleansed the temple of the merchants and money changers. All believers, as long as we walk this earth, have the capacity to be either carnally minded, which is death, or spiritually minded, which is life and peace. The carnal mind is enmity against God. In other words, our flesh isn't interested in what God has to say and wants to go its own way, chart its own course, do its own thing. If we're constantly wavering back and forth between the two, the inevitable result is double-mindedness. James saw this for the dangerous condition that it is and told us that such a one should not expect to receive anything from the Lord for he is unstable in all his ways. God doesn't want us unstable, saints. He doesn't want us to be double-minded, half-hearted, or lukewarm. He gave us the Holy Spirit so that we could literally have the mind of Christ. And prayer is how we tap into that gift of God on the inside of us and overcome our carnal mind, bringing it into subjection to the Spirit. Hopefully by now you're fully convinced of the need and importance of having an effective, fervent prayer life. We're going to pause now for some words from Potter's Wheel Films. When we come back, we'll talk about some of the different types of prayer in which we as believers are called to engage. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. So what do you think a thousand pictures would be worth? At Potter's Wheel Films, we want to help you find out. We're a Christian film company. We make movies that preach the gospel, demonstrate biblical life principles, and encourage other believers in their faith walk. We're also here to help Christian churches, ministries, performing artists, and others with your digital media needs. We're ready to take on any size project, from a 30-second teaser spot to a 30-minute TV show and beyond. We want to put our tools and talent to work for you to expand your audience and increase your ministry's impact on the community. Contact us at 217-494-7798 or by email 
at potterswheelfilms at gmail.com and let us open the world of digital video media to you. Welcome back. We're talking about prayer, which I think you'll agree is an extremely broad topic. There are so many different aspects to it that it's impossible to cover it all in a single half hour program. It's my hope that this program will whet your appetite a little bit and give you a hunger to develop or deepen your own prayer life, mainly because I know it will be a tremendous benefit to you, but also because I am keenly aware that our nation is in desperate need of a praying church in these days. So let's take a look at some of the different types of prayer mentioned in the scriptures. We'll start with what's probably the most common and familiar, prayer for healing. James said, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. There's a lot of controversy in the body of Christ on the topic of healing, but I really don't understand why. I mean, I really can't get my head around the argument of some that healing is not for today. I see zero evidence for that position in the Bible, but I do see that Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. I also see that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he healed during his earthly ministry, he's still going to be healing today. Do you really think he left us as orphans and absolutely helpless and defenseless against the attacks of the enemy? I really don't think so. Let's break it down to basics. God is good and does good things. Satan is bad and does bad things. Sickness is a bad thing, is it not? Has it ever been a good thing? Now, it's true that God can take a bad thing and make it turn out for good, and he does it so well that sometimes our dumb head can get confused and think that God willed and caused the bad. But the truth is he didn't, but he took what the enemy meant for evil and made it turn out for our good. I could take up the rest of the show making the case for divine healing, but there's a lot more to talk about, and a lot of other people smarter than me have covered this, so let's move on. Paul specifically directed Timothy, and by extension all of us, to pray for kings and for those in authority so that, listen to this, saints, we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really want a government that tells me when I can and can't go to church. I don't really want a government that tells me what to believe about where I came from or who I am or where I'm going. I don't want a government that doesn't know how to secure our borders or provide for the common defense. I don't want a government that infringes upon the constitutionally guaranteed rights of its citizens. I don't want a government that rejects God, rejects his moral law, and celebrates sin. I don't want a government that can tell me whether or not I can read the Bible or puts limits on when and where I can share my faith and testify about what Jesus has done for me. And I'll tell you something else. Our forefathers didn't want that either. They took on one of the most powerful military forces in the world of their day, not once but twice in order to secure our freedom from tyranny and the blessings of liberty. They put it all on the line in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. My last word on this topic is to quote the author Taylor Caldwell. The people deserve their government. Did you know that when we pray, sometimes angels are dispatched to help us? Take note of Daniel, whose visitation from an angel of the Lord is recorded in chapters 10 and 11 of his book. The angel says... From the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your word. The Bible is full of episodes where people have been given supernatural eyesight to see into the spirit realm and found that there was angelic help available to them that could not be seen with the natural eye. Check out 2 Kings 6 as just one for instance. Another common prayer is a prayer for deliverance from our natural and supernatural enemies. The Psalms are full of this kind of prayer. You can't hardly open the book of Psalms without finding a, for instance, of David or one of the other psalmists crying out for deliverance. If you want to practice praying the scriptures, the Psalms are a good place to start. 
We're also encouraged to pray for provision for our every need. Paul said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The Bible also says that we have not sometimes because we ask not. Think it over, saints. I know people who are shy about asking Daddy God for specific things, even in the face of that particular scripture. We really need to get our minds renewed sometimes, don't we? Folks, when you find within yourself some philosophical or doctrinal or theological belief that doesn't line up with the Word of God, can I offer you some encouragement to just go all 2 Corinthians 10, 5 on that thing and cast it down? Guys, it's simple. If it doesn't line up with the complete counsel of the Word of God, it's most likely a lie from the pit of hell and it needs to go. Most of that kind of stuff is designed to do one thing, hinder you from walking in all the power and authority and blessing that your Father in Heaven wants to give you. The sooner you pluck it up, cut it off, and cast it from you, the better off you're going to be. Don't ask me how I know. We're also called to pray prayers of intercession, just like Abraham prayed for Sodom or Moses prayed for Israel. During the Babylonian captivity, the prophet Jeremiah wrote to the captives and directed them to seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. Our country is in greater need of a church that understands and practices the power of intercessory prayer like never before in my lifetime. We must stand in the gap and repent for the failures and the sins of the church. We need to confess our sins and humble ourselves before God. I am firmly convinced that we are living out right now today our own modern day version of the Babylonian captivity and the only way out of it is to do what they did return to our first love. We must repent of loving the things of the world more than we love the things of the kingdom. We must confess our sin of catering to the flesh instead of crucifying it, of satisfying the self monster instead of denying it. We need to repent and take God seriously. Repent and take his word seriously. Repent and take his warnings seriously. We need to restore the fear of the Lord to the church for the fear of the Lord really is the beginning of wisdom. Probably the most often answered prayer I've ever uttered is the prayer for wisdom. I can testify that what James promised is true. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Time fails me, but I can tell you that many, many times in the course of my job, I've been given divine revelation and instruction on how to perform my duties or solve a particular problem. He has literally woken me up in the middle of the night to show me how to accomplish a particular task. So I tell you, church, if you are struggling in some area and you don't know how to proceed, let me encourage you, ask God. In my life, I have found that God really does know how to write computer code. He really does know how to edit video. I have friends who can testify that God knows how to wire a building or repair an oven or a dishwasher. He really does give wisdom to all who humbly ask, and he does so without reproach. Finally, there's the prayer of agreement that Jesus talked about in Matthew 18, 19, where he said, Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Partnering with another believer in prayer brings a multiplied impact. And like the old Petra song says, two are better than one. Our time is almost up, so let me leave you with some encouraging words from the Lord on the subject of prayer. Three times in the Gospel of John, the Lord says, Whatever you ask in my name, I will do. John echoed this sentiment in his first letter to the early church. David tells us that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. Don't hesitate to cry out, church. Your Father is listening. Let's close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to come before, boldly before your throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We thank you that you have given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So we humbly ask you to teach us to pray. 
Teach us, Lord, how to offer the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous. Teach us to pray the prayer of faith that will heal the sick. Teach us how to pray for the leaders in the various aspects of our culture, for leaders in government, in education, in media, in business, so that we might see the wicked removed from their places of power and influence and see the righteous exalted to take their place. Teach us to ask according to your will and to pray with divine authority and insight that we might fulfill your call to be a house of prayer for all nations. May our prayers make straight the way of the Lord that your kingdom should come and your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, God bless. A few years ago, the Lord dropped a prayer strategy on my heart that I still follow today, and I thought now would be a good time to share it with all of you. You may be familiar with the teaching on the seven mountains of culture, but if you're not, basically, it's a detailed teaching on seven different areas that influence the culture in which we live. As you all know, there are seven days in a week, so the strategy is really pretty simple. You just pray for a different mountain every day. Here's the schedule that I use. Sunday, we pray for church and religion. Monday, we pray for families. Tuesday is the education system. Wednesday is government and law enforcement. Thursday is media, news, commentary. Social media would fall into that category as well. Friday is the entertainment industry. And Saturday is business and economics. As always, pray as the Spirit of the Lord leads you. Be aware of what the Spirit is saying on that day and don't get locked into some dead religious tradition. Sometimes he might have you pray to strengthen the righteous. Other times he might have you pray to remove the wicked. Sometimes he might have you do both. The important thing is to pray for his kingdom to come and his will to be done on the earth as it is in heaven. God bless.